As a former elementary teacher, I got to see and witness firsthand just how important mental health is at a very young age. And I also witnessed kids, you know, my seven-year-old in second grade, they would have such limiting beliefs, fears, doubts, insecurities, really terrible body image issues. And I think some of it is because in the school system, mental health is really neglected. And I also feel at home, you know, even adults, a lot of us never actually learn how to show up for ourselves and how to prioritize our mental health and how to deal with these emotions. And that's why I'm so passionate about this and excited to be here today and talk all about mental health and to have Paris, who I feel is an expert with mental health. She is a podcast host, she is author, she's also a speaker, and she's someone that is not only living with bipolar, but she's living well with bipolar, so I know she's going to have just so many awesome things to share with us. Thank you (laughs) so much for having me. That was, you just crushed that, that intro. (laughs) I love it. My energy's like going, I'm ready to get into this topic because just like you said, when you open, just being an elementary school Mm -hmm. teacher and seeing this in your students, and really for me, that's when you know, a lot of my struggles started to surface, but I I still remember those teachers, right? Yeah. Checked on me who, you know, asked me how I was doing. But, you know, obviously we got into the intro. How did I get to where I am now? Right. You know, why did I decide to start a podcast? Why did I decide to publish my book? Why did I decide to become a speaker? And really, it all started with the story behind the story, which was for me, um, really, it kind of kicked off 10 years ago. So really, 10 years ago, December will be 10 years since I was hospitalized. And that's where I got my diagnosis of bipolar one disorder. I was placed on court ordered treatment, SMI. So for you guys who don't know what that is, it stands for serious mental illness. And then I really was kind of lost as far as trying to navigate my my life after that. Right. So I was in there for two weeks. I remember I came home and I was thinking I'm going to have so many tools and things that I learned to really be able to make a difference, to overcome the traumas that I feel like have kept me silent and stuck for so long. But honestly, I I didn't have any of that. I really kind of fell back into, you know, the same environments, the same people I had around me, the same limiting beliefs and negative thoughts that have, you know, even spiraled into suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, like self-harm, body image struggles, all of these things. And I think it's so important to get into it because I know it can be such a hard conversation, especially when we're talking about suicide. But I think it's important to talk about it because when we do talk about it, we show others who may be listening or know someone who is in a situation of, really how to be of support and, you know, to connect to those resources and just listen and be present. Because I know that's really what kept me stuck for a number of years is just feeling like I can't get into these topics. I can't share these things because it's uncomfortable. I don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You don't want to walk into no one walks into a room leading with, hey, guys, I was, you know, in a psych ward. And then I went back and, you know, a few years later, I actually went back and I worked as a provider at that same exact hospital. So that's awesome. So it was full circle, full circle. But to tell you to tell you that I really was like, okay, this is a full circle moment. I'm going to be able to go back and help people and serve. But what I noticed is I still wasn't able to share my experiences. I still wasn't, I felt like such a block. And because that block really stemmed from, would the people in here think of me if they knew that I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder? But if I, if they knew I was a patient here, if they yeah. were like, because I kind of feel like I tricked the system. Like I was like this almost like imposter. Who was I doing here? Right. How did mm-hmm. I have the, how was I able to get into this position? I kept feeling like I shouldn't, I don't belong here. So I feel like a lot of that really would just fester in me. And I said, you know what? The only way for me to get over this is to just start slowly with myself, sharing what I can for my story. And that's kind of when I I launched my podcast. So it was four years ago. I ended up, had no idea what I was doing. If you guys go and listen (laughs) to the first episode, you can hear rocks crunching in the background. I was on my phone, talking into my phone. And I just started with really just the relationship between our mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's a huge, huge, huge focus to you and your business and really what, you know, you do and help people with. Right. So I wanted to come on and talk about that and really get into that meant for me. But even though I didn't feel still comfortable, like sharing this in person, I just said, I'm going to start here. And then I ended up sending it out to like everyone I knew. I was you guys, (laughs) I started this thing, a podcast like listen to it and I didn't know what to call it. So I was like, oh, you need to name a podcast. I just knew Mm -hmm. I recorded it. And I was like, that's just to show you how beginner I was. Like I had no idea about you need to have a name for this. You need to have like, what are you talking about on the podcast? So I ended up naming it 
Crooked Illness, which is my book, because I was in the process of writing it. I had like a Microsoft Word document Mm -hmm. and I was writing it, but I just was like, I'm going to call it this because Crooked Illness to me means the way we can't often see the ways in which we're being crooked to our own selves because the struggles that we face with our mental health blind us and cause us to actually believe that the people in our lives who have the best interests at heart are good people are against us and we're alone in it. So Mm -hmm. that's one side of it. But then also the illness side of people who live with mental illness, people who live with just mental health struggles, whether or not you have a diagnosis, we all have mental health. We all have good days. We all have bad days. We all have moments where we're going through loss, grief, growth, all these things. So I wanted to have something where it could one day blossom into a community for other people to find people who look like them, yeah. who they can have access to and not feel so isolated. So alone. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think that's a huge part is realizing, especially nowadays, like there's so much help out there. I feel mm-hmm. like there's more help than ever when it comes to coaches, when it comes to therapists, when it comes to books and podcasts. Like if you want to get the help, you have access to it. And it really does come down to you like realizing that you're worth it, you know? And I love that you're sharing your story. And in many ways, you're like inspiring me too, because I really feel that it's important to recognize that everyone has dealt with some form of trauma at some point and some form of pain, right? And I'm sure like even myself, I'm sure most people look at me and see me as this super happy, super positive, like upbeat person. And while yes, I definitely am, I've worked so hard to get where I'm at today. Like believe it or not, I've honestly never opened up or talked at all about this. But in middle school and high school, like I definitely struggled so much with a lot of the insecurity and a lot of those just negative body image so much to the point that I would harm myself. And I actually have this huge scar right here from high school because honestly all about a boy but long story short I saw this text message and I had so much like pain built inside of me and just fear and all these things boiling up and I didn't know how to control that so I instantly grabbed a knife and just was in my parents kitchen and sliced myself bad enough that my mom ended up having to like rush me to the hospital and a lot of it's because I just at that young age, like I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. I was mm-hmm. never taught that. You're inspiring me to open up and share this just because I feel so many people would probably never in a million years guess that about me, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a reminder that like I can get where I'm at today. So can you. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for even sharing that, for even speaking up about that because I know how hard it is to, to say something like that out loud and really mm-hmm. what you said at the end of when we can do these things and talk about these experiences, because that's really how I felt. Is to, it's really to help give a glimpse into what our mindset was like. What are the circumstances? What Because I feel mm-hmm. like there's a lot of people who don't understand suicide. They don't understand self-harm. They don't yeah. understand these things because, you know, for them, maybe they haven't experienced it, but they might have people in their life who they are impacted by it, but yeah. they just don't know what to do. They don't know how to start the conversation. They don't want to, you know, make someone uncomfortable. And I know like when you talk about your scars and what happened with that, I know I still have mine. I remember I would tell people about this, but it is hard when people, I remember like being in in high school and going and we were doing some project and I went to like grab a marker and there was a guy in the class and he like grabbed my arm and he mm-hmm. literally said in front of everyone like, you know, oh my gosh, are you trying to kill yourself? And I just remember in that moment, like we all have these moments, like whether it's 10 years ago, 20 years ago that we remember like yeah. there yesterday. And I remember just my heart sinking and I felt so, and I just like, I really, what are you going to say? Yes. You're not going to say that. So yeah. I was like, I just didn't say anything. And I remember people like got silent and I just, I, I just remember that, that moment. And then later that day, being sent to the nurse's office and they were like, oh, like, let me, what's going on? And, and I just remember being so afraid and lying and being like, I fell yeah. down, I fell off my bike. Like, and it's like, clearly you could, that isn't what it is. But I yeah. feel like the people that I was talking to at the time were like, I don't know what to do with this, this girl. I don't know. So I'm just send her back. And I, and again, like when you talk about these overpowering emotions mm-hmm. and getting this text message and, you know, remember just feeling so hopeless and alone and just so out of control that's really what a lot of it was for me is just feeling so much of that. And then but I didn't want to because I feel like in the, in the times that I did express it, I remember something that I can share with you that I talk a lot about in my book is the impacts of going through a sexual assault at 15 mm-hmm. years old. And I remember opening up about this to some girls in my school who I was close with and we were hanging out. And I remember I don't even it was so weird, like how this came up, but we're all talking. And I remember one of them was like, asking all of us like have you guys ever had sex with anyone and I was just like I was quiet I didn't say anything but 
one of the people who was my friend was like, oh, Paris has like and then this is and then they were all looking at me and being like, wow, like who did you like what happened? And I was like, I just remember like feeling like tears like swelling in my eyes and just like completely like feel like I had to bullshit through that and be yeah. like, yeah, this is what happened and whatever. And I just remember like later being this is like a friend that I opened up to that I told like what happened. And I remember telling and then I ended up getting around the school and I remember like walking through the hallways and just hearing like, oh, like slut like this is and like the whispers and all that. And I just remember like feeling like it just continued to like perpetuate in me that I really was like something is inherently wrong with me. I played a role in what happened. I could have done more. And then I would like discredit my trauma and be like, yeah. I could have been killed. I could have been, you know, for sure. I could, it could have been way more severe. And I would like constantly put myself down to the point where I almost convinced myself that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then I would just cope with it in a negative way, which for me was going out, partying around people who my this entertainment kind of personality mm -hmm. and a lot of different men, different women who really just liked that person. And then when I started to do the work and I was like, I don't want to do these things. Those people were, you're boring now, you're lame, yeah. all this stuff. So I'm sure you pro can probably under totally understand like just getting into the progression of when you finally give yourself permission yeah, absolutely. to heal. And to be honest with yourself, I mm -hmm. can so relate of how many times I would try to convince myself that something didn't happen. And mm -hmm. even like that story I just shared, I mean, even to this day, my mom might be listening to this and be like, what? Because I totally played it off that, oh, no, no, that was an accident. I told mm -hmm. everyone it was an accident. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, I just tried to convince myself that that wasn't for, wasn't real, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest part for anyone that's experiencing any type of pain right now, any type of trauma or any type of limiting belief is being honest with yourself, mm -hmm. is actually like being real with yourself. Because once you're real with yourself and you're honest with yourself, then you're going to be able to open up your eyes to actually looking and seeking the help that you need. Mm -hmm. I think that that when you said start, it's because that's really for me, it all starts with you and yourself. And I mm -hmm. feel like when I was finally able to give myself that permission to to really say it is OK, still feel that that shame, that fear and uncomfortable, but just start with myself anyway. And that's what I did. I mean, even before I launched the podcast, I started out first on I like made some videos on Instagram and like posted it. And then it was like I started like talking about therapy and like my experience with that. But I didn't expect people – the messages I got back for, from people that I knew in my personal life who were like, yeah. oh, I had no idea that you were hospitalized or that you struggle with this. And, you know, it's really cool to see you talking about it. But then I also got other messages from people who were like, – I remember sending my – when I first started my podcast, sending it to friends, right? And I remember someone literally being like, Paris, like, I don't even listen to podcasts. Stop sending me this. Like, I'm not going to listen to it. I don't even care about this. And I remember that. It's always that one thing that stands out. And then you yeah, get a million good course. comments, a million good support. And then it's like that one message where it's like, this is, you know, and then I was like, wow. But it affected me for a little bit, but I didn't give up. I kept, I really kind of use that as fuel to say, okay, this person just doesn't understand, you know, this yeah, topic. And it's absolutely. not, and I think also understanding what, what is, people's interests, right? I mean, I feel like everyone wants to say, oh, mental health is such a hot topic. I'm so into mental health, but it does affect all of us on a foundational level. And that's mm -hmm. why I love that you say start with ourself because I can honestly tell you guys, if I did not start with myself, I would not be here on this couch speaking to you. I would not have been able to, first of all, meet my husband and then just this past March celebrate our first year of marriage, yeah. like our first anniversary <laughs> together. Yeah. But see, it's a lot of these things where sure. I was able to recognize in myself, what are the patterns of pain that I have picked up from other people, relationships, friends, wherever mm -hmm. this external circumstances are, but how am I becoming that person? Yeah. Because I remember there's this cycle of like, when people and I started to realize that like I've been through these things, but I also was like, I want to take accountability mm -hmm. for what I can't control people's opinion and perceptions of me or my story, but I can continue. I can control how I show up and the messages I share and why I'm doing that to help the people I'm helping. But I think, again, it goes back to ourself, our relationships, our habits, what we do with our time, our environments, our habits. I didn't have any awareness into any of that yeah. at all. And yeah. I started to – I really can tell you honestly, like I really started getting heavily into this work. It was six years ago is when I made that commitment to like start small. But ever since then, like it was four years ago that I launched my podcast. So yeah. see, it was two years – those two years of when I just needed to get into the work. And then I started the podcast. I published my book like two and a half years ago. But it, it's really this momentum of continuing to let yourself – get uncomfortable and also know that 
why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's for a greater purpose. And I'm not just, we're not just out here sharing our stories, right? And talking about these things that are so personal and so scary because I never thought that I would be getting on a mic and saying, I was hospitalized. I went through this, you know, surviving, you know, suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, all these things working in the hospital, you know, getting into advocacy because I was afraid. I always let the good outweigh the bad. And really, the bad is a lot of it is created by us. Oh, for sure. It's for all, sure. stories we tell us of the fears that aren't even there, sure. but we mm-hmm. we think it's so true. Or we assume that people are thinking this way and yeah. assume the worst, you know? And I love that you talked a lot about how it really starts with yourself and mm-hmm. really recognizing that like you can only control what you can control. And the truth is that no matter how long you are on your journey when it comes to mental health, and I stress that it is a journey. It's something that you will constantly forever have to be working on mm-hmm. that you're still going to have life is going to throw you curveballs, you know, like even this week, I had a week, okay, just some stuff behind the scenes was happening. And it was a lot. And but I really had to take a step back. And that's when I went outside, I laid in my fake grass, grounded myself, <laughs> soaked up the sunshine and just reminded myself too that no one can take away my gratitude. And no one can mm-hmm. take away so much of what I have and that mm-hmm. relationship that I have with my life with myself. And I constantly remind myself too, I'm like, no one's going to take away my joy. No one's going to take away my sunshine. Mm-hmm. Like I've created that within me. And I love that so much because when you said that, I remember the the post on your story when you said, <laughs> I, I was reading that. Yeah. I was like, and I love it because you get us, you get the people watching and viewing to step into, tap into yours, to see that in you and then say, okay, what is, what am I grateful for right now? Mm-hmm. And I remember I replied back to you and I said, I'm grateful to connect with you yeah. and, and get into this topic because yeah. I know it's going to help so many people listening, whether you're going through a life transition, you're going through a change, you're experiencing pain, loss, grief, or maybe a new beginning because also, to be honest with you guys, like especially living with bipolar disorder, right? New good things can be triggers as mm-hmm. well, like new life events. Cause, and I was pretty, I would hear that and I didn't believe it. I'm like, oh, like I don't know what that even would look like, right? Yeah. Why would this be a trigger? But I remember, to be honest with you guys, like I, when we got married last year, we got married, we moved into our house. So we bought our house, moved in, then we had the wedding, then we were gone. <laughs> we left for the honeymoon. We were gone for a month. I was transitioning out of one job to another job, dealing with a lot of stuff in like toxic workplace. But mm-hmm. then also like I was struggling a lot with my identity because of I was about to let go of the podcast and I was about to like, I'm like, I'm never going to talk about this again. I'm going to just quit. I'm never going to talk about my book. I'm never going to do more speaking. I'm not going to do it because I felt so forced into like a category of you need to be pushed into something that doesn't align with me. I remember I took this program and a lot of it was like for me, like kind of transitioning me into like coaching. And I did Mm -hmm. that, but I just felt like I'm like, it just doesn't fit right now. Not that I ever won't. I just feel like it's not authentic to who I am right now. And I'm being kind of like, this is the path that I have right to be on. And I remember I can tell you a conversation that was really powerful for me. And this is why I think that this is the universe, God, whatever you believe in that shows up for you. Mm -hmm. We were on our honeymoon. We were in Rome and we were attending a dinner that was organized by a woman who gets locals together. It's such a great experience. And we're all sitting at this at her home around the table and we're going around and we're telling everyone like where we're from and all this stuff. And I remember they got to me and I was like, my name is Paris. I'm from Arizona. I work in textiles for this company. And then my husband cuts me off and he's like, no, he's like, she has this podcast. She wrote this book. And like, he's like my like that hype guy. And and when he said that there was a man and he instantly as soon as he said he said the part about the book, he's like, wait, what's your book called? What's it about? Like question, question, question. Yeah. And I was like talking with him and I was like, wait, but tell me more about you. Like, what what, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I'm here to speak at, you know, there's a conference in Romania. And I said, what are you speaking about? And he ta- he said he was speaking about habits. And I looked at him and I just looked at him and I just felt this like, I don't know what it was, but I was like, you wrote Atomic Habits. You're James Clear. And oh he said his friend started laughing and he was like, holy shit. Yeah. Wow. And then we I had this. The <laughs> yeah. So see, we had this. And yeah. that, that was the night. Before that dinner, I told Dan, my husband, I said, I'm going to make an announcement and tell everyone that I'm shutting down my page. I'm, you know, not going to do the podcast. But then I was also so worried about my own stability Mm -hmm. because that had been something that connected me to purpose, community, relationships. But I just felt like it wasn't. And I really he helped me realize that it was that one piece that was causing you to be out of alignment. And that Mm -hmm. really, for me, sticks and is overarching in life. Right. Sometimes there's this one thing in our life that causes us to see like darkness and everything. Yeah. We shut down where we get into a mindset where we, we're having these negative thoughts. We're having these spiraling feelings that can lead to suicidal ideation, 
suicide attempt and even dying by suicide because of this one thing that feels so overpowering. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And just having him sit in front of me and really just give me that encouragement. That's when I was like, you know what? This is what I'm I'm doing. I don't need to be fit into this box that I'm yeah. put into. And I know you can definitely relate a lot to that as well. So I just wanted to share that story with you guys is like having that dinner and, you know, being across and having James say that to me and really just see something. And I think it comes down to like we see in ourselves or we have that mm -hmm. the value, the belief. But then when you feel like you're stuck and you're trapped, you start to like lose that. Yeah. And having those people like, you know, whether it's your partner, friends, community, someone you don't even know, a message mm -hmm. from a stranger, it really means a lot. It reminds you. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I think it's we feel the pressure of the world. I mean, from a young age, we are expected to do certain things or we see that you're supposed to go this route. You're supposed mm -hmm. to go the traditional route. Or, you know, with coaching, you're supposed to go this route and this. And you can easily compare yourself, you mm -hmm. know. And so it's something I'm constantly, even to this day, especially as a business mentor, just because I see so many of these mm -hmm. successful business coaches and they all go this one route and they all talk about this one thing mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel aligned with me. And so even to this day, it's like I'm constantly reminding myself I don't need to put myself in a box just mm -hmm. because – other people are doing something doesn't mean I have to do it. Like mm -hmm. I can do it my way and and I'm going to figure it out. And also reminding myself to not be in such a rush. Like that's something that's really helped me too is that I don't have to be in such a rush to figure everything out. Like mm -hmm. let life take its time. Like yeah. one day at a time, you're going to figure it out. Oh, that's so <laughs> good. That is so good because I can tell you guys when you were saying that, something that hit me was this this transformation, this new chapter that I'm going on. So literally yesterday actually was my last day. My jaw handed in my resignation. Oh, congrats. And thank you. It's so exciting. Thank you. But I, I did that and I was like, I, yeah. I was like, I'm gonna share this with Meg. Cause I'm like, yeah. I feel like we're this is something that would yeah you, we you'd understand. But I did this and I remember feeling so excited. Mm -hmm. But then also like to have the opportunities that I have, right? And also know that you don't need to be in a rush because I feel like I've always felt like yes. that. Like I'm like, oh, I need to do, you know, I need to do it this way or, you know, it has to look like this or all these different pieces. But I feel like what I've learned over time is, you know, to really be present oh, in yeah. where you are now, the opportunities mm -hmm. that you have now. And just also to look back because before I came to talk with you today, I was talking to my husband and he said, he said five years of when you, because we met five and a half years ago and I met him before before the podcast, before my book, before speaking, before I ever was at all public about my experiences, mm -hmm. he was one of those first people that, you know, I told. And he was always like encouraging me and telling me. And he's like, I, he's reminding me if I want you to celebrate this moment and to have someone who's like, this is what we're doing. You're resigning. You're doing this and you're, you're continuing to build on what you've built. And I feel like I was always looking at someone to tell me to like stay where I am. Yeah. Right. And I was like, I was like, oh, yeah. I would ask, like, <laughs> ask my mentors. I would ask my like people that are, have been mentors for me for years. I would, I would tell them what I'm doing. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, you should have done that. And I was like, I'm like, are you, and I would always like question it. And then I remember in this moment, I had one of my mentors who was telling me, she's like, you, you know how many times you can reinvent yourself? How many mm -hmm. jobs? She's like, she said, she's like, I was an elementary school teacher. And then I got into my own jewelry company. And then I got into my nonprofit. And then I got yeah. into like, so many things she's done. Like, And then I feel like I was so wrapped up in identity because I feel like, especially with bipolar, something I was told when I was working back in the hospital, I remember someone working there and she's like, people who mental illness, like they can't ever be successful in a career or like, mm. you know, make it far, like be stable or hit six figures. And I feel like I would hear all that stuff. I was like, how is that? That's not real. So I feel like so yeah. much of my drive was to do this, to like prove that I could like show people. Yeah. And once I hit that, it was like, it was kind of sad because it's almost like happiness is like, it's like, I do this thing and I get it and now but I need to do this and this and it's constantly moving and you never you never give yourself the opportunity to feel that you are in this moment. Yeah. And I think that that was what I was I'm holding on to now as I transitioned out of this and like now like full time into what I'm doing and being present. But then having people around me who are like whether it's you're messaging me that, you know, an episode of the podcast helped you or your friend or whoever it was, but really being able to see the impact and not be so stuck into my identity of like I'm leaving this or I'm going into this or and going through those phases because a lot of you guys listening you know you might be in that position right now whether you're maybe you're starting something maybe you're thinking of starting something maybe you're transitioning in or out of something but the message I want you to hold on to is that there is so much value and there always has been in your lived experience 
And I feel like oftentimes we think that our life doesn't have value because of our lived experience. Yeah. Because we hold on to the shame. But really, it's those stories that we have inside of ourselves that we feel like we need to keep to ourselves Mm -hmm. that really it shows you who you are and how powerful you are. And whether or not you, you feel called to share that, just I want you to remember really how much value you already have because it's always been there mm-hmm. this it's entire time. never too late to reinvent yourself. Mm-hmm. That is such a good reminder. Also, I just love how you chatted so much about your fiancé or your husband, my bad. I was thinking about my fiancé as I said that. <laughs> how much your husband just really encouraged you. I feel the same way with my fiancé. I don't think I would have or I know I wouldn't be here today. He was the mm-hmm. one who really pushed me to start my podcast, to go all in on my Instagram, even when my friends at the time were kind of making fun of me and just like mm-hmm. not seeing what I was doing. And uh, having that supportive partner means the world. And I hope that us talking about our supportive partner just encourages women to never settle and to find someone that really is going to just push them to be the best version of them. Yeah, because I can tell you guys, like there was so many moments where I feel like especially when you come from – abusive relationships or unhealthy relationships, Mm -hmm. you really think that I'm never going to find it. And I feel like for me, a lot of it was tied to I didn't give myself the opportunity to heal from the sexual assault, the abuse that I suffered and like just other relationships and like Mm -hmm. kind of healing from this, but then moving forward. And I remember when I first met Dan, like I was like trying to sabotage it because I'm like, I want to like do something so you will like leave me or not want to do it anymore because I don't want to be the one to hurt you or like break up with you or break your heart. I want him to see something in me and be like, that's it. Well, I remember telling him about my story and we were at this restaurant and I remember I just like broke down in tears and I'm like, I had this diagnosis. I was hospitalized. I, you know, worked in this clinic and the same hospital I was a patient at and like I really just I, it was like I didn't expect to cry, but yeah. I remember just feeling like in my, something in me was like, OK, this is good. I'm telling him because he's going to like leave. Yeah. And I was like, I can finally set him free because I know he's too good. And I remember he told me he was like, thank you so much for sharing this with me. It makes so much sense because he told me he, I had him on my podcast because I got so many just questions and requests and I had him come on and actually answer all of these. But he said. He's like, I remember when you told me that it just really opened my eyes to so much because he's like, I remember I feel like you were always all over the place. You wouldn't you were kind of like moving all over and yeah. kind of wouldn't really get he's like, you were very surface level and you didn't want to like go deep. And I he's like, now I see you have such a massive heart and I feel like you try to act like you don't. You try to act like you're you have like this exterior where you try to act like I'm heartless or cold or whatever to like be cool. Cause mm-hmm. I feel like back in the day it was like whatever, where people would be like, I'm catching flights, not feelings. Like I'm going, (laughs) it's like, I don't ties to anyone. He's like, I feel like you were, you would try to do that to like protect yourself. But he's like, he saw through it all along. And he saw, he was like, you need to do this and had that encouragement. But I feel like he made me feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I never had that. It was that safety of where I was like, I can tell you everything because other relationships, like I would open up about this and I had people be like their families, like, oh, Paris has bipolar And it was always just everything of like who I was. Bipolar Mm -hmm. was like my whole identity. And I'm like, that's something that I'm dealing with that I'm managing, right? It's not like my whole person. And I feel like it kind of became this like weapon of like, oh, if you or like do something, I'm going to tell everyone that Mm -hmm. you have this diagnosis or like very controlling. And I feel like I just felt stuck and I was like further caught me into why I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah. And having Dan be like, you know, I'm so grateful you're doing this. And just he's always been like, ever from the beginning and it's just having a husband like that who is so sees that value in you but then also he told me what I've helped him with overcome my way of coping what happened to me was I can control what I do and I can go out and I can sleep with whoever go do all this and it'll help me forget what happened and it was my way of brainwashing myself until like it really wasn't that bad and that was further keeping me stuck it was an unhealthy way of coping and now my way of coping is I have 10 things I track every single day. So I have this journal, like I fill up multiple journal, I fill up multiple pages of journals. I go through so many, but I track, you know, and I also don't hold in too much on if I don't meet everything every day, just like so I can see kind of where I'm at, right? So reading a book, I say meditation or silence. It can be really what I do is silence outside in the sun, no phone, no nothing, just sit there in 10 minutes. And then I also track out workouts. So did I do a workout in the gym? Did I do a workout outside? Did I listen to a podcast? And then also, uh, what time did I wake up? What time did I go to bed? Did I take my medications? Did I, what time, yeah, like sleep? And then also just reading the silence and meditation. 
but then also kind of having all of this to give myself oh, gratitude. So I write out five things I'm grateful for every day and just brain dump of mm-hmm. like a page. But I feel like I start my morning like this and my day like this because it helps me feel grounded and not let those thoughts become over consuming. Mm-hmm. I love that you shared that. It's like you read my mind because <laughs> every single episode I like to end on a positive takeaway. But I figured for our episode, we could end on things that we do to prioritize our mental health in a mm-hmm. positive way. And it sounds like you just shared a bunch of those. And mine are very similar. I, I call it grounding, going outside in the sunshine as mm-hmm. well. And and my big thing too, like something that I am so strong about is turning to gratitude. Mm -hmm. So even like I shared on my story early this week when things happen, that's like the one thing I instantly turn to. Mm -hmm. I just start focusing on like a look at the things in my life that I am really grateful for, the Mm -hmm. good things that are going on. Because we focus on the good, the good gets better, right? And it it instantly does bring me back to a little bit of calming my body down, a little bit back to that joy. So that's a big thing. I also love reading. I have read so many self-development books. I will say right now, I don't know if it's the fact that I am about to get married. I, a couple months ago, randomly just picked up this love story book, this romance novel, and I have been kind of glued to reading some of them for fun right now. But I definitely huge fan of self-development books and journaling as well, too. And and honestly, just really being in tune with myself. And I encourage all of clients to do that as well, too. Like recognize when you feel like you might be hitting this burnout mm-hmm. phase or this breaking point or or when you feel like you're putting yourself in a box and something doesn't feel aligned with you mm-hmm. or maybe you're surrounding yourself with people that are bringing your energy down. Like I feel it's so important to constantly mm-hmm. strive your best to stay in tune with yourself and like what's going to bring you joy. I love it. All of it. I, yes. I'm just like, especially when you talk about the books, the journaling, the gratitude, those relationships, because I mean, I didn't use I used to read, right? I read like 30 to 40 books every single year now. And a lot of it is, you know, whether it's people I've interviewed, whether it's memoirs, whether it's whatever the genre is, I feel like it's having something just for you, for yourself that you enjoy that keeps you feeling peaceful and grounded because we're going to be hit with things. We're going to be hit with the good, the bad, the changes, the things that life presents. So So yeah, just really being able to hold on to that and also know, right, no matter where you are right now in your life, in your story, just you have always had worth. You've always been enough. And I feel like it's so much of, at least for me, was not feeling that for so long because of what I've gone through. So feeling like my way of dealing with it was like, I'm going to do things to for people or have that people pleasing or all these different things, but really how we can do it together. So I think just, you know, something that I want to end with, right, is to remind you guys of one way that you can live well is really to tell yourself at the end of the day, you know, was it that brought you light today? Mm -hmm. What was that one thing? What was that one moment? You know, no matter how big or how small, just to really end on that, because I feel like I try to do that, you know, at the end of every day um, with myself or with my husband, you know, whether we're doing it together, whether I'm just doing it, telling myself what that thing is, but just really having to go to go back to that because there's so much we have already that we're not aware of. I always remind myself, not every day is going to be good, but there's good in every day. And if I can't think of anything I'm grateful for, I just turn to my body and being alive. I mean, not everyone woke up today and is alive. So Mm -hmm. that is something we all can turn to. But as we wrap things up, I just want to remind anyone listening, if if you ever need anything, if you ever feel like you're struggling, you're going through something, Mm -hmm. I know both Paris and I are here. We're in your corner. We are rooting for you. And we really do hope that you feel you can reach out to us. Yes, of course. And yeah, the number one way you guys can reach out is my Instagram is livewellbipolar or my website's periscopy.com and I'll always answer, respond. So never hesitate to reach out to share your thoughts on the episode or what resonates for you. But it's been an amazing conversation. Yes. I feel like I could talk to you all day long. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Yes, thanks for being here.